Hi, everybody. If you guys, if any of you want to move up closer, you can. There's no exam or anything, so it's... Um, but if you, if you want to see and hear a little better, feel free to move up. Um, thanks for taking time out of your busy uh, week to be here. I know everybody's got a lot going on, but appreciate everybody being here. Um, we have a very special guest here today, tonight with us. Um, and the way this is gonna work, she has a presentation first, and then we should have some time for some questions if you guys have any. Uh, some of the students today asked some really good questions about her career and about how some of you can launch your career in TV news. My name is Steve Krasik with the Belisario College of Communications. And this program is brought to you by our college, Belisario, and also the Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasters, which has a visiting professionals program. So again, thanks for being here. So our guest um, tonight is Kate Snow. She's an NBC News senior national correspondent. Uh, you've probably seen her on TV at some point. Uh, she anchors NBC Nightly News Sunday edition. Uh, she's also worked in her long career at ABC News, at CNN, at NPR, and also in local TV in Albuquerque and some other cities in New Mexico. Uh, she's, she's not a Penn Stater. She went to Cornell University and Georgetown, uh, but her dad is a very well-known professor uh, retired from Penn State, so she has a lot of uh, state college ties. So please welcome uh, Kate Snow from NBC. We are, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, not really, I mean, I actually know it. Uh, it's gonna be weird with a mask on, but I'm gonna follow the rules, so hope you don't mind. Hi everybody, it's really nice to see you all. Thanks for coming out on a Monday. Wow, that's impressive that you're here on a Monday. Um, so I don't know if you've, you've noticed this, but Facebook has been getting some attention like the last week, anybody seen that? Um, a lot of dumping on Facebook, and I know that some of you in the crowd are probably saying like, isn't that the one for old people? Right, yes. Um, but Facebook has about, um, let's see, uh, three and a half billion people use Facebook every month, three and a half billion. And that includes all their apps, that includes Instagram, WhatsApp, and that's actually grown 12% since last year. So that's pretty big growth. A few of the harsh headlines in the past few days, USA Today said Facebook whistleblower says company puts profit before people. The Verge said Facebook runs the coward's playbook to smear the whistleblower. And on our website, NBCNews.com, Facebook's whistleblower is prompting some users to log off forever. So Facebook's taking heat. I think personally rightly so. But there is no denying how much the media landscape has been reshaped by Facebook and all the other sort of younger social media platforms. Tonight, with some perspective, with 30 years in the business, I wanna talk a little bit about how journalism is going in the face of and the age of social media and how it's really been reshaped the digital world that we live in, the connectivity that we have right now, all of it has fundamentally changed the way that I do my job, the way that journalism happens, the day-to-day -day operations of my industry, uh, in two ways, both on the side of news gathering, the way we collect the news, and also on the dissemination side. And I also wanna talk a little bit about consumption of information and how misinformation and information on social media and online as well has really changed everything for us. So if you guys don't know me that well, I'm not an influencer, okay? I am not a commentator. I'm not an opinion person. I am what you might call an old school journalist. Been doing this a while. Um, Steve mentioned that I've been at NBC News now for about a decade, and before that ABC News for about eight years, and before that CNN, I don't even remember how long, about I think six years. I am also all over Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, yes, and Snapchat. I do not have a TikTok account for the record because my 16-year-old daughter looked at me and was like, Mom, absolutely not. Yeah. She was like, don't even try, you're embarrassing. 
Um, I, anchor, I anchor nightly news on Sunday nights at 6.30. That's the same show that Lester Holt anchors during the week. Monday through Thursday, as Steve mentioned, I, I have this title of Senior National Correspondent, um, which means I do a whole lot of things. I don't have a super set um, beat that I cover. You can catch me on today's show, on Nightly News, on Dateline. It's a little different what I do now versus what I did before this. Um, for years, I covered politics, Capitol Hill, the White House. I used to cover a lot of breaking news, everything from hurricanes to plane crashes to wars to Ebola. At this stage in my career, I've been explaining it as I tend to cover stories about the human condition. I cover a lot of mental health stories, a lot of stories about sexual assault, unfortunately, Me Too kind of stories, um, stories about substance abuse, stories about medical initiatives and innovative treatments, allegations of mistreatment at various places. I've looked recently at youth group homes. Um, stories about injustice, I guess, is a good way to put the kind of stories that I do. And assuming that a lot of people in this room don't get a chance to watch a lot of nightly news, I thought that I might take a couple of minutes to show you, just to get a sense for who I am, an exclusive story that we did last week um, so you can get a sense for the work that I do. I'll, uh, this is kind of representative of a lot of the work that I do. It's about a potentially revolutionary way to treat opioid addiction using brain surgery. So I'll ask Steve to help me. James Fisher has been using drugs for more than half of his 36 years. How did you end up getting drawn to drugs? And from my social anxiety. And I discovered Xanax super early in high school. In his 20s, he looked like a different person, moved to painkillers and heroin, has been in treatment a dozen times, and even sober, doesn't feel right. I feel like I'm flat right now. How do you mean flat? Not happy, not sad, not just happy, sort of not sad, just in the middle, no emotions whatsoever. When we met at the West Virginia University Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, James was about to be the third person in America to have an experimental brain surgery that doctors hoped could be the key to overcoming his substance abuse. I mean, I'm getting holes drilled under my brain. Like, it's scary. Why are you willing to do that? Because I don't want to die. So that's James, is it right? Dr. Ali Rezai and his team mapped James's brain to find the exact paths to implant two wires carrying brain-stimulating electrodes. So if, if you're off by a millimeter, you're in the wrong spot. A kind of brain pacemaker implanted in the chest sends electrical impulses to the reward center deep in the brain. The brain becomes sensitized, this reward center of the brain, so you keep on wanting to experience that initial feeling to feel good from the dopamine high. So our goal is to regulate that or normalize the dopamine imbalance in the brain. Other signals are sent to the frontal lobe. Where decision making happens. That's right, right. exactly. Long term planning. Long term planning, the goal is to activate the frontal lobes more so you can be more in charge of your behaviors and make better decisions. We watched Dr. Rezai implant the first wire. How deep is the electrode? It's about then they woke James and tested the device. Were you feeling a change in noticing a little happier? Showing him photos of drugs and measuring his cravings. I'm not, um, uh, I'm still doing heroin craving. It's 100 feet in the, uh, most of it. So, like, I don't need to be happier. I'm still doing heroin craving. This is where you're living now? Yep. It's sober living? Sober living now. We caught up with James four weeks after surgery. How you doing? Doing good, great, fantastic. Feel weird at all, or? No, I don't feel weird. I'm just not depressed, not anxious, not irritable. Nothing gets on my nerves. James says he felt an immediate difference. 
some somebody covered up with a warm blanket. Yeah. And just just the feeling of everything's okay. I used to have a really hard time making decisions. You feel more clear now? Yeah. He's been sober three and a half months, now living in the same home where Jared Buckhalter, the first person to get this surgery, works. I'm coming up on two years of continuous sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> the only other person to have the surgery relapsed. But for Jared and James, the brain stimulation is helping them stick with the work of recovery. Has your personality changed at all? I don't know, because I really didn't know who I was before. I've never had a substantial amount of clean time to really nail down who am I. Without drugs? Yeah. So this is, you know, the longest I've been clean in a while, and I'm just starting to figure out who, who I am. Kate Snow, NBC News, Morgantown, West Virginia. Welcome to Winter Magic Cat. So, so again, I just show you that to kind of give you an example that I'll refer back to. Um, I have a, I have a question though. I need honest answers. Ready? Show of hands. Anybody in this room see that on broadcast television on nightly news last week? One, two. Wow. Okay, a couple people. I thought there'd be none. <laughs> um, and how many of you regularly watch NBC nightly news? That's more than I thought too. Okay. Uh, Today Show. Any Today Show viewers? Yeah. Okay, how many of you are on Twitter? That's what I thought. Almost the whole world of room. How about Facebook? Instagram? Yeah. Uh, Snapchat? TikTok? Oh, not as many. Wow, is that like a high school thing now? Is that, you guys are too old for TikTok? <laughs> it's, um, can you back a little, Steve, is it okay? Do you guys um. hear that? Yeah, it, it's okay. It's not. It's okay. It's not fixed, I won't go so close to it. Um, okay, so I ask you these questions because I, I think it shows that we can't dismiss the role of social media as journalists right now. Um, I mean, there were way more hands for every social media site than for Today Show or Nightly News, which I totally expected. Um, so I was an undergrad a really, really long time ago. Um, I started at Cornell, as Steve said, in 1987. There was no such thing as a cell phone, right? You wanted to meet somebody at Zeno's, you pretty much had to plan it ahead and um, make a time and, you know, just say you were gonna meet there at eight o'clock and if the person didn't show up, you just sip your yingling by yourself and that would be that. Um, so I had no idea what I wanted to do. P people ask me this today, several of you guys asked me in class, what I, did I know if I wanted, did I know what I wanted to do? when I was at Cornell, no, is the answer. I, I happened to see a flyer on the wall at my dorm freshman year, and I, it was for a radio station just off campus. And I thought, well, that could be cool, I could be a DJ. Like, I could play music. Uh, but when I got there, they said they needed volunteers in the news department. And so then I was like, eh, I could try that, right? See what it's about. Um, I ended up taking this, you guys know what a cassette tape recorder was? Like, Walkman type thing, it's really old. And I'd have that with a recorder, with a microphone. I'd go out to city council meetings, I'd go to car crashes or lectures or whatever was happening on campus, and I'd cover those as stories, record it, bring it back to the radio station. And a lot of people in the room aren't gonna understand this, but there used to be reel-to-reel -reel tapes, like these giant reels of audio tape. Kind of looks like a cassette, but like bigger. And my job was to edit, and to edit, you had to use a razor blade to cut the audio tape and then physically like tape it back together. I, I know, you're making a face like, what? Yeah, that's how we did it. So I learned how to do that. There was no recording into a phone. There was certainly no Instagram Live, because there was no Instagram. We used to get an alert when something was happening in the world because we would get a, what was called a wire service alert. And we still have wire services, right? AP, Reuters. But back then, there would be like an alarm in the newsroom that would go off. And that's how we learned that something happened. So if a bomb went off in Bangladesh, someone in Bangladesh would, would write a wire and put it out to the world. And that's how we would know, um, as a subscriber to the Associated Press, we would know that that was happening. And then I went to um, graduate school at Georgetown, as Steve mentioned. Still no cell phones at that point. 
It wasn't until I joined CNN as a producer and booker, and that was in 1993, that I finally had like the most primitive little cell phone where, does anybody remember you could text by hitting like um, number one once was A and twice was B and three times was C? The older people are like, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, so then after a couple of years at CNN, I decided that I really didn't want to just be a producer. I wanted to go back to what I had done in radio and be a reporter on camera if I could. I wanted to tell stories. So I moved across the country, kind of ditched everything, moved to New Mexico, became a one-man band. I had like 50 pounds of gear that I would carry around, <laughs> camera, lights, tripod. I feel like I'm, am I talking too loud? Is that what I do? Yeah, they, should I push it this way? Yeah, Down? Oh. Is that better? Ah, okay, sorry guys. Um, obviously, I'm not the most technologically able <laughs> person. Just <laughs> Is this better? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so I had 50 pounds of gear. I would. Um, no, that's not better. It's <laughs> Okay. This is fine if I turn it down. So. Uh, so, okay, you guys know what a stand-up is when the person's on camera, the reporter is on camera? I would take my, um, my light stand and I would set it up, I would focus the camera on it, and then I would run over, kick over the light stand, stand in its place, and sh shoot myself doing a stand-up. That's how we did it back then. I, I, want to picture, I want you to picture that I had a company car that I drove around that was powder blue. It was a K car for people who remember. It had Action 7 News like emblazoned on the side of the car. Um, and they gave me in New Mexico, because they're a little sort of further behind than Atlanta, where I had been at CNN, they gave me this giant brick of a cell phone that was like this big with an antenna on top. Anybody ever seen the movie Wall Street? I don't know, maybe not. Okay, but they had phones like that in that movie. <laughs> just, just these giant, giant phones. So, and if I couldn't get a signal, I'd have to go to a payphone, which I assume you guys know what a payphone is, right? They just don't have them anymore. So you see, you get the point, right? Like there was, when I started out, when I was your age, there was absolutely no such thing as social media. There was no Facebook, there was no Snapchat, there was, there was no MySpace yet, which is even way before I think you guys, around when you guys were born. So how I found stories was that I talked to people. I went out in the community, I made a list of people I would call every single day. I would call the mayor's office, the police department, the sheriffs, the jail. I read the local papers when I lived, this is in southern New Mexico. I stole from them sometimes. I drove around, um, I saw things, I, this is a true story, one time I saw a giant pile of burning cow manure and I wondered, what's that about? <laughs> Turned out that a feedlot had shut down and just left this giant smoldering pile. So I did a story and I stood on top of the pile of cow manure. This is a true story. <laughs> stood on top of the pile and shot a stand up. So that was then. And, and listen, it really didn't change for about 10 years. Like I feel like the first 10 years of my career, people started using email and there were fax machines, but things didn't really change until the day that I, I, I remember the day that someone told me about tweeting, right? And I said, what, like a bird? What? <laughs> I don't understand. And I remember thinking that if I joined Twitter, it was going to be burdensome because the way I was thinking about it was as if it was like an email inbox and I would have to read every single tweet in my feed, you know, like every single message all the time. But pretty quickly we realized um, in the news business that, that there was a value to social media for us. So, and maybe some of you are wondering, wait, uh, you like social media? But, but here's why. Because when it comes to news gathering, last Wednesday there was a shooting at a high school, right, in Texas. The first that we heard about it at NBC News was through a data miner alert, which is an AI system that scans Twitter and other social media, um, you know, public messages all over the world. And when something is bubbling and happening, even if it's still small, data miner will find it and we'll get a red flag and we know 
that something might be going on in Texas. Um, it's typically faster than the wire services now. And again, usually driven by, by Twitter. So as soon, but it could be other, you know, other sources as well. It could be other social media. And as soon as we become aware of something happening, we have a, a whole internal system at NBC that kicks into gear. We have people who start to look for what we call UGC, user generated content. And that means social media posts of whatever's happening. So they scan looking for photos, looking for video. If they see something, they're gonna reach out, verify that it's authentic, that it's somebody who's actually there, try to get permission to use that on NBC. If you think about the fire stories that we covered this summer, the forest fires, in the days before social media, we would have rushed like one crew to an area of California and they'd be running all over the place and the only video we would have gotten would be from where that crew set foot, right? What they saw with their own cameras. Now, my colleague Miguel Almaguer can do a story about fires and feature, the, the opening shots can be and were this summer, a, a dad driving through just a, a field of fire with embers hitting the windshield and he's saying his kids are screaming from the back seat. That's not anything that we shot. That's something that the dad posted on social media. So we'll also look for eyewitnesses who are posting about an event when breaking news happens. Sometimes um, my colleagues at MSNBC might, on cable might actually put them on the air uh, to talk to an eyewitness right away. It works because social media is where all of you are, where everyone is, right? There was a, a Pew study in April this year that found that seven in 10 Americans use social media. So not surprising, 70%. That's been relatively stable for the last five years now. YouTube has 81% of us. 69% of Americans use Facebook. 40% use Instagram. 30% on Pinterest or LinkedIn. And about a quarter of Americans use Snapchat. Same number for Twitter or WhatsApp. TikTok. 21% of Americans, so it's kind of low, but I know you know this, just like my daughter said, it skews young. So there, that's like a young audience. Um, Reddit is also grabbing about 18% of adults now. YouTube and Reddit, by the way, are the only platforms, according to Pew, that had st statistically significant growth over the past two years. So we're, we're all on it. Just because everybody's on social media, though, that does not mean that we put everything that happens on social media on NBC News. Um, we are still gatekeepers. We still worry a lot about sourcing and about facts, and we have meticulous standards about what we go on the air with. On Friday, just a couple days ago, I saw a really detailed standards note in our system. Um, it was about some video that we saw that came in from overseas uh, bombing at a mosque. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the, uh... <sighs> it's hard to wear, how do you professors do this all day? You just, I know. man, you don't realize like talking, it's hard. Um, okay, so there was uh, a bombing at a mosque on Friday and so there was a standards note about what we needed to say to accurately provide context for that video and warn viewers that it was graphic. And that was after we'd already verified that it was real, that, that it was authentic. Um, we verify breaking news with, with people on the ground. We report, we call, we, we call locals. We, we have reporters uh, who might be based in those regions. We have what we call stringers, which are people that we hire when we need them all over the world. So we sort of know people in every country that we can call. I could tell you stories for hours about how many times we have thought something was happening in the world because of a, an alert from data miner, like, oh my God, there's a school shooting, watch out. And then it turns out not to be true, right? It turns out to be something that was a rumor. Um, thank God. So the rumors that you might be seeing on social media and you might be absorbing, we're not gonna put on NBC News. And my, my bosses are very, very clear about this, that accuracy matters far more than being first. So I think that's, that's important. Um, but when we can authenticate a story, it's often because of social media. And even for stories that, that aren't immediate breaking news, like I was just describing, social media is a driver. I mean, right now, I don't know if you guys are following what's happening on Capitol Hill and with the Biden administration. 
we are following Joe Man Senator Joe Manchin's Twitter account like you wouldn't believe, right? <laughs> Trying to figure out what his next move is. I don't know if I need to say this out loud, but President Trump was probably the best at understanding the power of social media and using it to get his message to the press. His press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, just wrote a book, she's been getting a lot of attention for this, um, in which she says the president, quote, didn't think we needed any more briefings for the White House press corps because he could reach everybody directly through Twitter. And he did. Um, those statements, whether you love them or hate, hate them, they were newsworthy things that he was putting out on Twitter. So for years on Sunday during the Trump administration, when I was anchoring, we would hope and pray that he would not put out a tweet at 5 p.m. that would be super significant because it meant that we had to rejigger the entire newscast. We had to tear everything up and start over, write a piece. So it was, as a journalist, it was, it was difficult. Um, President Biden does, does not do that as much. He doesn't, he, he often, especially on weekends, will um, what we call, call a lid, like say that they put a lid on things and they say, oh, we're not gonna put out any more significant statements tonight. So that's sort of the impact that I see social media having on the news gathering side. So now I wanna talk about the dissemination of the news and the impact it has there. Contrary to what a lot of people think, our audience on broadcast networks is not gone, right? We were talking about this today. Uh, nightly news on weekdays, I looked it up, averages about seven million viewers. I think weekends are a little less. I'm, I don't know our most recent number, but it's a little less than that. The brain surgery story that I just showed you was seen by seven million people. So, and that's a really good thing, by the way, because otherwise I would have no job. <laughs> so. So there are people watching on the on, you know, old fashioned way, right? Um, but the number of people watching nightly news on demand, on their phone, and seeing that piece via social media is also in the millions. And for the most part, those are two different groups of people. So we are getting added visibility from all the digital people watching on digital. Um, another Pew Research Center study, survey back in January backs up the shift that we're all pretty familiar with, which is news consumers moving from TV, from broadcast to digital. It found that 86% of US adults say they get their news from a smartphone, or I'm sorry, a smartphone, computer, or tablet, often or sometimes. 86% of adults get their news from a smartphone, computer, or tablet, often or sometimes. That's a lot higher than the 68% who said they get their news from television. Roughly half of Americans said that they prefer to get their news on a digital platform. This one's reassuring to me. Only 11% rely on social media for news. But if you look at it another way, there was another survey by Pew that found that about half of adults in the US get news on social media at least sometimes. Right, so only 11% are relying on it, but half of us are at least some of the time getting our news on social media and Facebook is a regular source of news for about a third of Americans. What all that means is that I'm no longer just a TV reporter. I'm a reporter for digital platforms, and I'm a reporter on social media myself. I did a, a series of stories years ago about transgender kids. We profiled a five-year-old transgender boy named Jacob. Beautiful, beautiful little boy, Jacob LeMay in Boston, super cute. I did a version for Nightly News, I did a version for the Today Show, and then we did two digital stories, which could be longer, right? So that's the other thing about this, is that we can get more time, we can put a longer product out, longer story out on the digital platforms. Jacob's story um, was told by his parents in their own words, and we posted it on Facebook as well. The night before, we posted it on Facebook the night before it would air on Nightly News, the last time I checked, it had more than 50 million views. Just that one story. It touched a lot of people. Um, when I met James Fisher, who you just saw having brain surgery in West Virginia, that piece, I took dozens of photos and videos in that operating room, because you saw that I was in there, which by the way was really, really cool to be in the operating room. Um, I took photos of James at home beforehand. My social media team gave me clips that I could post. And all of that content went on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, 
about this man who was the third person in the US to have this experimental brain surgery. I posted about being in the operating room. I posted about what the doctor told me. I, I was able to add more content on social media, things that you know, the doctor had said that I didn't get into that TV piece that you watched. Um, and I know that a lot of people, maybe people in this room, will only see those posts. They never actually go to the link and get to the story that I did for Nightly or for the Today Show. I, I see, I treat social media users as a completely segment, separate segment, like a separate audience from the TV people. Although I know there's a lot of overlap too. So uh, in the piece you saw that I only mentioned Jared, the first man to have the brain surgery. I mentioned him really briefly. You remember that? I said he now lives with the first person to ever have this surgery. I actually interviewed both James and Jared for an hour each. So Jared got like five seconds in my nightly news story, but we then did a, what we call a nightly news film, which is an eight or nine minute version of the story in which we featured both of these men. So again, that's another way that we're reaching, we're disseminating content in a completely different way than even 10 years ago when I started at NBC. Most of my social media feeds are devoted to work. You guys probably, if you look me up, you'll see that. Um, I intentionally try not to post things that are um, super personal about my kids, for example. I'll post only mostly pictures of the back of their heads because I just feel like I want to protect their privacy, their teenagers. And I don't always post about the stories that I'm doing because I don't, I don't want to, my followers to think that I'm only promoting myself all the time. I'll post things about things I see out on the road, about you know funny pictures that I take and stuff, especially on Instagram. I talk about being a mom. Uh, I talk about being in a band sometimes. I talk about my husband, all kinds of stuff. And, and this all brings me to the third point that I want to make. I think the way that we all use and consume social media right now has shaped society completely. And, and that in turn shapes the way we act as news media, and, and this one's gonna take a little bit longer for me to explain. Um, but essentially, I feel like we've become a nation of oversharers. Do you guys, do you guys remember Seinfeld? Anybody watch Seinfeld, even like on demand? <laughs> okay, Seinfeld had close talkers and low talkers, remember that, and double dippers, and we're oversharers as a culture now. And by, by that, I mean, no offense, but millennials and Gen Z, you guys are leading the way. You guys share everything. Everything, like you've grown up in a world where you're rewarded for posting pictures and photos and videos of every moment. And I admire you for the openness that you have, I really do. Um, it's like, here I am, you know? <laughs> this is who I am. I'm living my authentic self. And, and you know, you're also like, deal with it. Right? Like, you just put it out there. I don't know, at least that's my perception as an older person, <laughs> that the, the folks that are here that are in college are probably just like, you know, this is what I do. So I like red wine, I like hiking and camping and sitting by the ocean. I don't really get jazz very much, but I like indie rock a lot. My husband's a DJ. I secretly love Bon Jovi, and then I met him recently, and it was awkward for me. Um, I also met Bono one time. Somebody asked me my favorite interview ever. It was probably Bono with you too. I like to travel. I sing pretty well. I am in a, in a band. Um, and there are some videos of it on YouTube to prove that. Those are the kind of personal details that everybody's grown used to, right? Me sharing all that with you guys. Now think back. Some in the room will remember a guy named Walter Cronkite. He was the anchor of CBS Evening News for many, many years, 19 years. Um, I have no idea if Walter liked jazz or wine, right? I have no idea if he could sing or if he had a band. <laughs> Doubt it. Um, he never shared anything like that about himself. There really wasn't a venue for him to do that. And he was an authority figure. He was the guy telling us about the world. He ended every broadcast saying, and that's the way it is. You can look it up if you guys have never seen that. I, I would. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he, he might have hated Facebook. And so as, as someone who grew up before social media and after, you know, my first reaction to Twitter was sort of, oh, do I have to? 
but for the younger generation, it's a given that, that we're gonna share these multi-dimensional lives and our interests and our hobbies and what we do in our spare time and our opinions, lots and lots of opinions on social media. There's this huge emphasis on being authentic. And I think that that has dramatically influenced the way people perceive and judge the news and the way that they consume the news. On the perception front, the more that we all overshare, the more people want to know that what my what my true feelings are. Like what 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 does Kate Snow think about something, right? And and again, I'm an old school journalist, and I was trained not to do that. I was trained not to espouse my opinion. My approach is to give the facts and let you guys judge a story and make your own judgment. But but that approach, my my old school, I keep saying old school. My desire to be neutral running is, is, is now kind of brushing up against this oversharing culture that we all live in. And I, I think that people have become cynical about journalists partly for that reason. Because they think we're hiding something. Because we're not oversharing and saying everything about ourselves, um, at least some of us. And because none of their Facebook friends are neutral, they're like, well, What's up with Kate Snow, right? What's up with journalists? And I think that also creates a kind of self-selection that we all know about by now. It feeds the algorithms that companies like Facebook created. Americans live in their own bubbles. If you're on Facebook, most of your friends like a certain thing. The algorithm, as we learned from the whistleblower last week, is gonna push more of that content at you, whether it's a hobby or cute boots that you were looking at online or a political opinion. So we end up with reinforcing feedback loops. Friends pass around the same conservative stuff, or friends pass around the same democratic political memo. And sometimes it becomes so self-reinforcing that, that people have a hard time recognizing that these are not neutral sources of information. I wish that all online information was created equal, but it's not. The truth is that NBC News is a credible source, and so is the New York Times, or the Washington Post, or the Wall Street Journal. And yes, they have opinion areas of their newspaper, but, but generally they're fact-based news. And there are opinion pieces, editorials, and fabricated clickbait stories on the other extreme. There is such a thing as fake news, I think it's just, in my opinion, a little different than what some people consider fake news. To me, it's news that contains no fact, right? It's, it's a place or a piece that you might find online that is completely fabricated and made up. I, I know about this um, personally. Like, there are articles about me online. If you Google my name, there's one that says that my husband and I are getting divorced. We're very unhappy. And you, if you read it, like, the syntax is the English language of it is not well written. It looks to me like a bot wrote it, maybe like a Chinese bot or a bot that doesn't speak English very well. We have been married for 22 years. We are fine. We're not getting divorced. But that's that to me is that's a, an item that is fake. So in depressing news for my industry, um, BuzzFeed reported years ago that the most popular fake news stories were more widely shared on Facebook than the most popular mainstream academic studies were shared. And it's only gotten worse during COVID. I think we all know that. Um, people who are anti-vaccine have shared ideas that, that honestly have no basis in medical fact. And that's happening. And sometimes we don't even, as consumers, read the fine print. An, an often studied 2016 study, often cited, a uh, study out of Columbia University found that 59% of links shared on social media have never actually been clicked. Have you guys done this where you forward something but you didn't actually click on the link and read it yourself? So 59% of us do that, according to this study. Um, in 2020, Twitter started sending prompts to people if they tried to retweet something without opening it first, they actually send you something. I've, I've had it happen to me when I've tried to forward stories that I wrote it, 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 it tells me that I shouldn't forward that without reading it, <laughs> even though I wrote it. Um, but that, that's indicative of where we are, and all of that means that we journalists, we have to work even harder 
to differentiate ourselves in this world. The value of NBC News is from the way that, that we work a story, um, from the reporting that we do. We talk to sources, we report, we check, we, we fact check. I'm sorry about the mic. Um, I think that sometimes people don't understand the layers of editors that one script goes through. We, we take great pride in getting things right. So that piece that you watched earlier, I wrote that piece myself after like going through hours of tape and logs and all kinds of stuff. Took a long time. Sent it to my medical unit producer, sent it to our senior producer, the executive producer of Nightly News, the legal team, the standards team. It's a lot of layers. And I have to believe that there are enough people who still recognize the difference between what I do for a living and everything I just described and what some guy writing like a completely fabricated story maybe in his basement, what that person does. There's a big difference. Often we find ourselves reporting about social media as well, like the Facebook whistleblower story or the pieces that I've done about um, negative mental health effects of social media on children. The interview that I did a couple weeks ago with the new DEA administrator, which I mentioned in class today, um, she declared a national emergency because of a huge number of fake pills, counterfeit pills out there that actually have fentanyl in them. They're being sold on Snapchat. Everybody in this room, please don't take a pill if you don't know where it came from, because four in 10 of those counterfeit pills are containing deadly amounts of fentanyl. Four and ten. Sorry, that was a sidebar public service announcement. Um, so we report about social media as well. Um, I firmly believe that, and I was saying this to the dean earlier, people still, consumers of news, still need curators. They still need some way to make sense of this fire hose of information that's coming at us all day long, every day, right? The flow can be overwhelming. And I think that our, I hope that our viewers appreciate that we're culling through all of this information and distilling it and trying to offer context and provide nuance, help people understand the facts. The process, it, it's not perfect, absolutely not, but we're trying. And I think one of the hardest things about the social media world that we live in is, is the speed of information. When I started in the news business, we could air something on the evening news and it would not be outdated by morning. I could read the morning newspaper way back, you know, 20 years ago, hard copy, right, of the actual newspaper in the morning and I didn't have to worry that everything was gonna change during my 30 minute commute. But that's no longer true. Like I often, read the New York Times on the train going from my home to New York City, and by the time I get to work, that story's already outdated. It's crazy. But we can't go back, like we can't change it. We're not gonna go back to the days of that giant brick cell phone that I described that you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Look it up, giant, giant cell phones. Um, we can't go back to that, so we don't have any choice but to adapt as journalists to the world that we live in and the social media scene that we live in. Right now, NBC, I've been telling people, um, students that I've met, that NBC is pouring a lot of resources into a new online streaming, it's not that new, but a relatively new online streaming channel that we have, um, which is called NBC News Now. It's what they call OTT, over the top, meaning it's content that anyone can watch, even cord cutters, if you don't have cable, you can get it on any device for free. It's also available on Peacock, which is the NBC streaming platform. Um, that seems to be something our bosses are, are betting on right now. Again, they're hiring. Did I mention they're hiring? Anybody in the room looking for a job? Um, but people often, you can't see them smiling, sorry. I'm smiling. Um, people often ask me about how, how the world's gonna be consuming news in the future. I think that digital dissemination feels like where things are moving, streaming feels like where things are moving, but honestly, I don't know. If I knew, I'd make a lot more money. But what I do know is that it's gonna be something that we haven't even thought of yet, right? Because 10 years ago, I didn't anticipate where we are now. So 
I think the way people find news is evolving faster than I ever imagined it would. Um, definitely something I never, like I wouldn't have anticipated giving this talk when I was sitting in your seats way back at Cornell. What I know for sure is that a lot of these people in this room are, are gonna spend the next 30 years figuring out how to deliver news to the next generation. And what I do know is that the need for accurate information is not gonna go away, ever. The way we provide it, the platforms we use, the technology, that's gonna change and transform, but there will always be a need for good journalism. And in this moment, I would not change my career path for anything. I love the job that I do. People have been asking me today, and you can ask me more questions if you want about if I would change anything or if I would do a new job or a different job. Not right now. I really, really love what I do. I get to meet a lot of amazing people. I get to see a lot of amazing things. I witness history. One day is never like the next. Constantly learning about new subjects, surrounded by younger people <laughs> all the time. And that's part of why I wanted to come here and meet with you guys and talk with all of you about the way our world is changing. Because um, I'm inspired by all of you too. And I know that you, you have the next step like once I'm gone, <laughs> it's all up to you guys. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have for a few minutes. Does that work? Thank you. We could uh, throw them up here. Yes. Thank you so very much. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for coming and talking to all of us. It uh, means a lot for us to have you here. Um, so my question for you is, you know, you spoke a little bit about kind of like leaving your job as a producer and stuff like that and then going to Albuquerque and kind of forming your TV news career there. What was that jump like from kind of going to a producer to, you know, in fairly local market and then mm -hmm. also jumping to the bigger market like New York City, going to NBC, going to, you know, CBS, doing all that type of stuff? Or ABC, C sorry. CBS is the one network I never worked at, but sorry, yeah. No, no, I'm laughing, yeah. It's, it's the only place I've never worked at. Um, so yeah, um, great question. The, the jump from being a, I guess I was 23 to 25, I was working in Atlanta as a booker producer for CNN. And it was a good job, it was a great entry level job. But I just had this feeling like I wanted to go back to reporting as I had done on the radio. And um, it, it, it was not easy at all, first of all, to get the job in New Mexico. I kind of glossed over that earlier, but some of you have heard the story. I literally made a tape, even though I wasn't on air, I had to kind of create what we call a tape, you guys call real um, examples of work that I could do, even though I wasn't doing that work at the time. So I had to beg lots of people for extra help outside of work hours and be like, can you shoot a stand up for me? Because we couldn't do phones, right? There were no phones, like you couldn't shoot on an iPhone. You had to have this giant camera and lights. So getting the job was hard. I sent out about 100 tapes and I got three offers around the US. And I ended up taking Carlsbad, New Mexico, which like New Mexico is a rectangle, it's down here in the southeast corner. In the, is there anybody from New Mexico here? Middle of nowhere, like middle of nowhere. I don't want to offend anybody from New Mexico. <laughs> I love New Mexico, but Carlsbad is very small. It's like 20,000 people, and the nearest mall was two and a half hours away. Yeah, right? So it was a huge change, um, and it was the best thing I ever did because leaving kind of the comfort of Atlanta with like coffee shops and bars and like a boyfriend, I had a boyfriend who I ditched and left behind, leaving all of that, and going to somewhere really small where they didn't even have a coffee shop um, was super hard, but it was, it was life-changing because I learned what a lot of you are learning in the communication college here. I didn't have that really practical TV experience yet, and I needed to get it. And I got that being a one-man band, as I described, with like, kicking over the light stand and shooting my own stand-ups and finding the cow manure. I mean, all that stuff, and making a lot of mistakes, too. A lot of mistakes in local news, like small local news, where nobody was really, somebody was watching, but not a lot of people. I, you know, I wasn't very good. I, was, I watch those tapes now, I'm like, oh my God. So that was a huge, it was a huge jump, and it was, for me, very much worth it. 
although I've said many times today that there are lots and lots of ways to get where I am, it's not like there's one path. And what was your second question? Sorry, do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. Which I love, I love that summary of like going from New Mexico to New York because there's about like 10 steps in between. <laughs> um, yeah, it definitely did not happen overnight. I, so I left New Mexico after three years. I had a bunch of different job offers. I had a boyfriend who wanted to move with me, who is now my husband of 22 years, contrary to what you read online. <laughs> and I, um, applied a bunch of local stations, including one that Steve used to work at, and or, well, same market. Um, Seattle, Denver, I applied a bunch of places. I ended up going back to Atlanta, um, getting a job partly because I already knew people from the booking job I had had, and I went back to Atlanta and became a reporter for a very like low level entry job reporter for the affiliate service called News Source. I don't know if anyone in the room is familiar, but um, that's the part of CNN that services affiliates, local stations. It's not really like the real CNN. I wasn't a full fledged reporter yet. And then I worked my way up to full fledged reporter at CNN, moved to Washington, D.C., covered Capitol Hill. ABC picked me up for the White House, covered George W. Bush for a while, moved, ABC moved me to New York. And that was to do Good Morning America Weekend Edition, which we were just starting. There had never been a weekend version of GMA. And I did GMA for seven years in New York, and then switched to NBC. Uh, we have time for one or two more. Anybody have in, uh, in back first? <clears throat> Sorry, I'll keep my answers shorter. That was a long answer. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Um, I'm a Tom here at Penn State. Um, I just have a quick question about, you know, you were saying that you wouldn't change anything for the world. You love your job, and you would also mentioned that you have a family. Um, I was just wondering how you, you know, advanced your career and traveled and everything and had a family life. Yeah, I get that question a lot. It's a really good question. Um, and I wondered that when I was in your shoes, like when I was in college, I thought I really wanted to have a career. I really wanted to work. Um, and once I got into local news, I was I was very driven. I, I guess that's part of where I how I got where I am because I, I was very driven to work a lot. Um, and there are trade offs that you make, and um, it is entirely possible now, present day, really possible for women and men to have families, and report, you know, do this this crazy job that I have, this correspondence job. I'm not going to tell you it's easy, because it's not. And I think increasingly we're recognizing it's not easy for dads either. It's not just a woman thing. It's like moms and dads struggle with this. I personally, my husband stayed home with our kids for 15 years. So for me, I, was, I feel like I was incredibly lucky that he was ready to do that. Um, because we could have done it different. We could have had a nanny. We could have done a lot of different things. but. Him being home while I was traveling a lot, especially like overseas and stuff, that was really, really helpful. But then I've had women say to me, well, yeah, what if I don't have a husband who wants to stay home? I think it's possible many other ways. I can name you 10 colleagues of mine right now who just had babies, including Kristen Welker at the White House, including Hallie Jackson at the White House, including Dylan Dreyer at a letter for something. Like, there's a whole lot of women in my industry uh, now, like in my network, who are having babies, whereas 20 years ago when I first got to the network level, there were very few women having babies. So it has changed a lot for the good, for the better. One more right here. Hi, my name is Harley. Um, I know you said each day is different for you, but what does a typical day look like for yeah. your job? There is no typical day. <laughs> um, it, on Sundays, it's almost always about the same because I anchor on Sundays, so I go in now, post-COVID, I'm finally going back, well, not post-COVID, but when things got a little better last spring, they allowed me to go back into the studio starting in April. We have a very bare-bones staff because of COVID, but and we have lots of precautions and masks and stuff, but I'm able to anchor in the studio. So Sundays are pretty much go in, have editorial meetings. There's one at 10.30, there's one at 2.30. Um, 
I'm sort of the managing editor of the show that night, so I'm paying attention to what the reporters are working on. Um, when their scripts start coming in, I'm looking at their scripts. I write the beginning of the show, the top of the show is always something that I write. So that's kind of a predictable day. I'm done at seven o'clock usually, unless there's West Coast news, and then we stay till 10 to update for the West Coast. Um, the other days of the week, it could be I'm up at four in the morning because I'm doing the Today Show. It could be I sleep in and I work till eight o'clock at night because I'm doing nightly news. It could be both some days. It could be neither. I'm working ahead on a story, like the brain surgery story. It took months to put together. Um, shot the first video for that in July, and it just aired a week and a half ago. So I'm always working ahead on certain projects, too. So it's hard to say what a typical day looks like. It's, it drives my family crazy, because they'll be like, where are you tomorrow? I don't know. And, and things can change. Like, they'll call me sometimes at 2 in the afternoon and say, we need you to, we call it crashing a piece. We need to crash a piece. That's a news of day, like, urgent thing that has to be done for 6.30. Sometimes the calls come even at, like, 4 o'clock, and you have two and a half hours to put together the piece. Uh, time for one last question. Um, I was wondering what your opinion was on um, like what to report. So I think that professional storytellers have the obligation to represent the world in all of its glory, like good and bad. But often I find that some of my friends say that people don't need to see that. Like I don't want to see that in the news. And I think that as an American population, we don't represent like we don't like to see blood in, mm. in photos. We don't like to see anything that kind of tugs at our heartstrings a lot. And that is very different from a lot of other like media, um, media industries like around the world. So I wanted to get your opinion on that. And if you think personally, that's the best way that we should be approaching our So our you're business. asking um, what's our obligation to do the stories that might be tough? Yes. Especially international stories. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that's what you're asking. I, I agree with you. I, I have, having a background in, um, I think Steve mentioned, I went to Georgetown. I have a degree, a master's degree in foreign service, which is international affairs. So there was a part of my life early on when I thought I might be a foreign correspondent. I really care deeply about the rest of the world. And I'm fascinated by international stories and international news. Um, and I agree with you that we don't do as much as we could. It's driven in large part by the fact that our, we know that the viewers, as you say, like they, they don't necessarily relate to stories that are very far away sometimes. So we have this balancing act that we do like on Sundays when we're putting our show together. We have conversations about how much should we, should we do you know, this whatever happened in Egypt, or should we do this story that happened in LA? And we, we weigh these things, and we try to find the right balance. Um, and we hope, that we, we hope that we do a good job, but it, it's hard because there's a limited finite amount of time in our broadcast, and we could do all international news if we wanted to, right? We could do no domestic news, but I think we do end up airing, most of the US broadcasts end up airing on the side of domestic because it's more, more relatable to people's lives. It's, more, it's gonna have more impact on them directly. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, because I agree with you that I think, I wish we could do like a whole other show that was just about international news, but we don't. That's a good question, though. It is a really good question. Uh, we wanna respect everybody's time, so we're kind of out of time right now. We wanna keep this to an hour, but thank you everybody for coming out here tonight, giving up your night. Uh, thank you, Kate, yeah. so much for- thank you.